Hello everybody and welcome back. Now we're into problem 9-1-D. So uh, this problem is a little bit different. Again, in my earlier video I talked about how there's so much similarity with everything that we're going to be doing in hypothesis testing that students often get stuck into a routine and forget about some important differences that pop up every now and again. Now, looking at this one, right away I can see, okay, single population mean, that sounds very familiar. Two-tailed test. Again, on an exam, on an assignment, you probably don't have that information just given to you. Part of the challenge is figuring out what kind of test am I supposed to be doing. So, let's just pretend like we don't know that for now. Let's go through this problem and let's see what we're supposed to be doing. So we're looking at a water bottle manufacturing facility. They're producing water bottles designed to hold 24 ounces or 750 milliliters. The bottles are produced, pouring plastic, yada, okay, I don't care about this. It's removed from, the, it's polished. And then we print labels on it to mark these various volumes. So. You've all had a water bottle, maybe you have one on your desk right now, and it has these different volume levels, right? So you fill it up to 8 ounces or 16 or 24 ounces of water, or whatever you're putting in there. Now, the company's quality assurance team periodically takes samples of 30 bottles. Oh, I've got a sample size here. Fills them with water to the 24 ounce line. The water from each bottle is then measured to determine if the actual volume, uh, determine what the actual volume is when it's filled to the 24 ounce line. So here we have this bottle of water that has a label that says it's 24 ounces right here. And what they're doing is they're filling it up to that line and then pouring it out and measuring how much water was actually put into that bottle. In other words, was our label correct? The water bottles measured, okay, over the years, we've got the population standard deviation, here is 1.4. Our most recent sample um, had an average volume of water of 23.6 ounces at the line that said 24 ounces. Use a 10% level of significance to test the accuracy of the label. Okay, so there's a couple of things that are a little bit different in this problem. So let's address the first one. So here we're going to formulate our test. And I know it's a single population mean. What kind of test is it that we're doing? Well, we have uh, a sentence right at the end that's actually telling us what it is that we're doing. We want to test the accuracy of the labels. Are they accurate? Does it actually represent 24 ounces? Or is it more than 24 ounces? Or is it less than 24 ounces? Right? Those are our options. Is it either 24 ounces or not? So with that information, I can determine that this must be a two-tailed test. So I'm doing a test here for equality. And I want to determine if the actual volume of water when filled to that line is it 24 ounces or not? So here I formulate this. So again, here's my justification, my explanation. I formulate it as a two-tailed test so that if the evidence supports the null hypotheses, then that supports the, 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 the claim that the label is accurate. I'm unable to show that it's anything other than what it says it is. If the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, well, now I have evidence to challenge the accuracy of that label. Now our evidence shows that perhaps it is not 24 ounces, it's something different. Okay, so, so that's my two-tail test formulation. Now we're doing this test at the 10% level of significance. Previous problems have been 5%, and so we have to make sure that we pay attention um, to that value when it becomes relevant, a little bit closer to the end, okay? So there we go, calculate our test statistic. Okay, so 
Once more, let's go through this graphically. I probably won't do this for all of the problems, but for these first few, that's fine. So again, here, this is what our distribution looks like when we assume HO is true, and we assume it's true with equality. We assume it's true with 24. Now, we have drawn a sample with a mean of 23.6. So 23.6, that's down here. <coughs> okay, so now what we want to do is really like everything else. We want to determine if our null hypothesis is true what is the likelihood of drawing a sample like the one that we have just drawn from that distribution? And to know that, well, we need to standardize our sample. Whoops, what a messy looking value, uh, table. Here's that distribution. And so now what we need to do, we calculate our test statistic. And do you see just how similar this is to every other problem that we've done so far? I have a standard deviation. The previous problem, we were giving a variance. So I need to make sure that that all checks out, that I've got exactly the numbers that I need for my formulas. And now I'll calculate that test statistic. So this is going to be 23.6 minus 24 divided by 1.4 over the square root of my sample size, which was up here, that was 30 bottles. Okay, pull up my calculator here. 23.6 minus 24, there's 1.4 over root 30. So that gives me, oops, negative 1.5, uh, that would round to 5.7, let's call that 1.57. Okay, so there's our test statistic, that's going to be somewhere down here, let's go red. Now again p-value approach, critical value approach. <clears throat> One of the things that we need to remember now is that we're doing a two-tailed test. Because here's what students are likely to do. You'll go to your z-tables, you'll find the probability that corresponds with your test statistic, you'll see that my test statistic is in the lower tail, you'll think, oh, I must be doing a lower tail test, not, subcon not, not consciously, but subconsciously, you're going through this process and you're getting that lower tail probability and you say, ah, there's my p-value. This is a two-tail test. There's one little difference on a two-tail test. Let's go through and see what we find. So, the first part is correct. I do want to find the lower tail probability. When we're doing a two-tail test, our rejection region is now going to be divided. It's not like a one-tail test where I'm going to reject if my sample seems to be too small or appears to be too small to have come from my assumed distribution, or an upper-tail test where we reject if the sample appears to be too big to have come from my assumed distribution, meaning the probability that this sample came from that distribution was very small. So it probably came from one of the larger sample mean. A two-tailed test, well now we're going to reject our null hypotheses if our sample appears to be too big or too small. So that rejection region is now going to be divided on both sides of the distribution. Meaning if that sample is large, relative to my assumed value, I'll reject. If my sample is very small relative to my hypothesized value, I will also reject. So 
when we're getting the appropriate p-value, it was fairly straightforward. For an upper tail test, I wanted the upper tail probability. For a lower tail test, I wanted the lower tail probability. For a two tail test, well, which one do I want, the lower tail or the upper tail? I actually want whichever one is smaller. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that is in, in just a moment. So when I look at my distribution here, I have a test statistic of negative 1.57. The value that I want to find in my tables, I want to look up what this value is going to be. Okay, so we want the lower tail probability. So I'll scroll down here and I have a test statistic of negative, there's negative 1.5. 7 is way out here, so that comes down, there we go, so that gives me a value, we can round that to 0 0.06. So that's telling me that here is a probability of 0 0.06. <clears throat> now, what students will so frequently do because you get into a routine. You do this habitually, and you're going through this process, and I got my, my, my null and alternative, my test statistic, now I go through, okay, here's a probability, and you say, okay, well, there's, there's 0.06, my level of significance here is uh, 0.1, or 10%, I, I'm gonna reject. My probability is less than my level of significance, I reject. And then you go on from there. Well, now you've lost marks and now everything else that you say is wrong. Because you skipped over an important detail from the very beginning of this exercise. And that's this test right here. It's a two-tailed test. And again, if you get into this routine, you might forget. Because, of course, formulating the test was step one. So by the time you go through the calculations and you get to your Z tables, maybe you've forgotten about what you did back in step one. So here again, we have to make sure that yes, we can benefit from knowing this routine and getting into this, you know, this bit of a pattern, as long as we don't forget about the small details that make everything a little bit different. So here I have a two-tail test. This 0.6 is not my p-value. For a two-tailed test, my p-value is going to be equal to 0.06 times 2. So for this test, my p-value is 0.12. And again, you've heard me say in some of the previous videos, the p-value is the probability of obtaining a test statistic at least as unlikely as the one that we have just obtained. At least as unlikely. So as unlikely or more unlikely, less likely. Well, when we're doing a two-tailed test, values that are smaller than negative 1.57 are less likely. So that's part of the p-value. But so too, and again, we can take advantage of the symmetry and knowing that this is positive 1.57, those values in that upper tail are also less likely. They also occur, occur with a smaller probability. So that's why we multiply this by two, is to take into account the fact that values on both extremes of that distribution are at least as unlikely as the one that we've just obtained. So this is our p-value, and now hopefully we can see how in this example it actually completely changes our conclusion, because now I have a p-value of 0.12. Now compare that to my level of significance, which is 0.1 or 10%. Well, again, applying that p-value rejection rule where we only reject if the p-value is less than or equal to that level of significance, right? That is when we would reject. In this case, it is not. 
If I chose to reject my exposure to a type 1 error is greater than what I am comfortable with. I'm not willing to take that chance. And because I'm not willing to take that chance of committing a type 1 error, which is rejecting it when it's true, yes, that's true, rejecting it when it's true, I thought for a second I made a mistake, I'm not willing to take that chance. I'm not willing to take that chance of rejecting it if it's true. We do not reject. And they say, no, I have insufficient evidence to support the alternative hypotheses. Our evidence here supports the null. Now, before we kind of get into a more detailed interpretation of that, let's look at uh, our critical value approach again. And so once more, it's important to remember that we reject if our test statistic is too large or too small. Which means our rejection space is split in the upper tail and the lower tail. Now that level of significance has always defined the size of our rejection space. If we come down here a little bit, you know, just as a, a quick reminder, well, if I was doing a lower tail test, I would have Z alpha, right? And there's that area alpha, my level of significance. If I was doing an upper tail test, well, I would have Z alpha here, and that would be the size of my rejection space. When we're doing a two tail test, the size of my rejection space must still be equal to my level of significance. But now it's split between the upper and lower tails because again, I'll reject if it's too big, I'll reject if it's too small. So now I want to divide that by two. So now I have half of my rejection space in the upper tail, half of my rejection space in the lower tail. Now we will reject if it appears as though that sample appears to be too large to have come from that assumed distribution, or it appears to be too small to have come from that assumed distribution. Okay, so if we look back at our level of significance, our level of significance is alpha, which means alpha divided by 2 is 0 0.05. In the last few problems, A, B, and C, we've had a level of significance equal to 0 0.05 for those one-tail tests. So we already know, I'm taking a bit of a shortcut based on what we've already done. We already know that that corresponds with a value of 1.645 here and negative, let's clean this up a little bit, negative 1.645 here. And that gives me an area, this will be 0.05 here, this will be 0.05 here. Okay, and if you're not sure where that number came from, you just watch one of the earlier videos where I go through it in a little bit more detail. Okay, so the same rule applies is that we must always get the same conclusion using the p-value approach or the critical value approach. And so here I can see, okay, my test statistic is negative. It's in the lower tail. So, you know, realistically, this critical value is not really applicable. I'm not going to compare my test statistic to that one. And, you know, more generally speaking, both of these critical values are relevant because, again, I'll reject if my test statistic is large relative to that positive critical value. I'll reject if my test statistic is small relative to that lower critical value. So it still is defining that, defining the rejection space. And of course, here now in between is where I will not reject. So generally speaking, of course, they're still, val they're still relevant. But once I have my test statistic and I see my test statistic is negative, well, the one that I'm going to compare it to is the negative critical value. So again, we see that consistency 
my test statistic in the lower tail is larger than the critical value. The critical value corresponds with an area of 0.05. So the area then that corresponds with my test statistic must be larger than. So here I can see this purple area is equal to 0 0.05. This red area, well, we found that was equal to 0 0.06. So we see that it's larger. And then for that two-tail test, we double it, our p-value is 0.12. So both of these approaches are bringing us to the same conclusion. We do not reject our evidence here supports the null hypotheses, which now for our interpretation, well, let's just remind ourselves what we're doing. We're filling water bottles. It's got a line that says 24 ounces. We're filling it to that line, and then we're measuring the amount of water to see if the positioning of that line on the bottle is it accurate. So here, given that my evidence uh, supports the null hypotheses, my interpretation of that conclusion is that, yes, everything is fine. I have insufficient evidence to show that that label or the position of that label on the bottle is inaccurate. Our evidence supports the claim that the label is accurate. Okay, so that's it for the hypothesis testing for this two-tail test. Now, one of the things that becomes a little bit different now, or that has the ability to become a little bit different, is that now we can also incorporate a confidence interval approach. Because as we'll see, there's always a consistency between an interval estimate and a two-tail test, not one-tail test, a two-tail test for a comparable level of significance. And I'll talk about what that means in the next video. So I'll make another video a little bit shorter just to go through part F of this exercise so we can have a little bit of a discussion about confidence intervals and how they relate to the test. I won't go through a big discussion, module eight, went through a longer discussion on confidence intervals. So here we'll just look at how that relates to the test. Okay, and that'll be in another quick video coming up right away. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye-bye.